Leah and Mara Webster with In Creative Company. And today I'm thrilled to be joined by the always wonderful Anthony Boyle to talk all about the Apple TV Plus series, Masters of the Air. And starting off, I mean, the the guy that you're playing, Harry Crosby, obviously is based on a real life character in the world. Um, and I love that you had such a wealth of information available to you from him because he did actually write a book about his experience in the 100th. And I was just interested in how you started diving into the material of being able to look at pictures of him, being able to find interviews of him speaking, reading his writing about his experiences to really start shaping how you wanted to play him on screen. Yeah, well, I had um, I had a real privilege that he had written a book called On a Wing and a Prayer. And if anyone who's watching this is interested in that time period or the show, I would really recommend reading it. Um, so many of the books and source material that we were given to read on this project were so dense and heavy and quite boring and this book was so funny i was struck immediately by by how funny harry crosby was in the like first couple of pages it's a world war ii memoir but he writes it with such like a satirical like viewpoint and self-deprecation that you can't help but like fall in love with him on the page and i just tried to get that like spirit and who he was when i was reading the book or who i felt he was when i was reading that book and translate that onto screen. And what what were some of kind of the intricacies you found in terms of like his mannerisms and his speech and in, in how you wanted to play him as well? Well, he um I had like a 10 minute clip of him. It was like a 10 minute clip of him in the nose of B17 when he's about 60 or 70. And he's talking about like his experiences at war. And having seen so much horror and devastation he still had this like kind of child like quality to him like his do you ever see when you see someone's mask here and it's like so bright that's like when i when i watched him he's he was an old man he still had such like felt like such love in him you know like radiating from him and i was like oh god how do i you know how do i sort of translate that how do i how do i do that so i would walk around my apartment like a schizophrenic a lot sort of you know just mimicking him you know speaking to myself as how I make a cup of tea as Harry Crosby and how would he do that and just little things you know what I mean just little things to how would he sort of be in life um and yeah would listen to that that clip every day going to work it was like a 10 minute clip and I would put it in we had like an hour journey so I would put it in and listen to it before I got to set so by the time I got to set I would have his rhythm his cadence, his accent, and hopefully some of the man mannerisms down. Um, yeah, so I didn't sound like this, and I sounded like sounded like Harry Crosby. <laughs> right, because there, there's a lot of dialect work in terms of not just the accent, but also the time period and the specific mm. cadence of speech being very different, the grammar being different in dialogue. Um, and so how did you kind of like sit there and really finesse the dialogue to find his voice? Listen, just listen to like old recordings of what they would have listened to at the time, like the singers they would have listened to, and like you know uh, the like the le the wireless and that sort of thing, and and just sort of see you know that that kind of old sort of rhythm that they had back then, and and just drill that into your head so it becomes second nature, and try and make lines like holy mackerel feel real, you know, <laughs> like try and make that feel like how we would say now, you know, holy shit, or whatever that go holy mackerel, you know, just trying to like translate what that would feel like to, to us you know to make it real and when you auditioned for the series in essence they gave you a scene and said you know take a look at this and see which character you're drawn to and you would be interested in in putting yourself up for and you were immediately drawn to Harry Crosby and I love the fact that you really saw him as like the antithesis of the types of characters and the types of people that we usually see in these stories because you know he's the guy at the back of the plane throwing up at the beginning of episode one full of flight sickness um, and so how did you really see this as an opportunity to like create your own blueprint of a character Character rather than the idea of you know characters that we've seen before in shows and movies like this well you know it's sort of it, when i read it it felt like oh, every everyone else was in band the brothers and harry crosby was in an adam sandler movie from like the 90s or something you know, I was, I, you know everyone was so cool and smoking and, and then crosby was throwing up and, and and going i'm not the right guy and i just sort of felt like that's infinitely more interesting to me you, for, for for whatever reason, I, I just found him really really interesting, you know. Um, and maybe if it was a script full of Harry Crosby's, and then there was one like cool guy, 
I'd want to, I'd want to play that. You know, maybe it's because he felt so different from everyone else in that world that I, I, I really wanted to, I really wanted to play him. Yeah. And when you were filming those scenes at the beginning of the show where we, you know, where we do see kind of like the air sickness, it's, you know, it's this physical response, but it's also just the emotional nerves. So how did you find the way in which you wanted that to exhibit? Because he's just getting to know these guys. So he kind of, he doesn't want them to know that he's nervous, but also there's no way to hide physically vomiting in the back of a plane. Um, how did I, how did I do that? I, I, I just felt like just, you know, just put as, as much nerves as, as as possible. Try and like emotionally put yourself in that aspect of what, what that would feel like. Uh, you know, it's it's a nerve wracking thing. So you don't have to do too much mental work to go. Oh wait, we're going up in this thin tin can and we're going to go fight the Nazis. That's you know, it's not. There wasn't too much like emotional work there to go. Oh, you would be shitting yourself, you know. Um, and then physically, just I don't know, it's sort of do a lot of press ups and get really like energetic and you know, just try and get into the physical, uh, you know, get your BPM up, get your heart rate sort of as nervous as he, as he would have felt. There's, and there's a lot of, you know, internalized moments with the character because, you know, going back to that idea that he's just met these guys, he's just getting to know them. And, you know, when he feels like he's made a huge mistake with the navigation, the way that he just kind of quietly internalizes that sense of failure was yes. really endearing to watch on screen. And so how did you set about just finding those moments of like quiet expression throughout the series of the way that he's processing things? Have you seen the whole show? Yeah. Um, I felt like people like Crosby are people pleasers. I felt like people like are always easy to smile, or want you know, and don't want to take up too much space in a in a in a, in a room or an environment. So when he does feel sad or angry, he's not going to go oh, for fuck's sake, or oh, go you know, and explode. It's all going to come internally. You know, we all know people like that. You know you know that kind of thing um so just when i was sort of you know building the character or whatever it, it sort of felt like his moments of grief anger or shame or whatever would all be felt more internally as opposed to externally and that's what felt natural in in the moment you know it, it, it's not so much of a cerebral process of me sitting down and going oh at that moment i'll do that it was just sort of like oh that's who he is you know i feel like it's just know the character as much as possible and then those moments you won't have to think about they'll just sort of they'll come and did you also you know off the back of that did you see him as a character and a guy who had a little bit of a sense of imposter syndrome as well because you know when it when it does appear that he has a really natural aptitude for navigation and instead of being in the flight he's now on the ground kind of overseeing multiple missions at first he's in a lot of disbelief like I'm not the guy that you you want for this job. Like you, you're surely you're thinking of someone else. Like you're giving me an office. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so funny. Like the whole way throughout the series, he's just saying like, I can't do this. Like, I'm not the guy. He never wants is like kind of. Yeah, I got this, you know. Um, even when he's like, even when he plans all of D Day, you know, he still like sleeps through it. There's something so funny about every like all of his all of his moments are just so like you know, backwards. Yeah, sorry, what was the question? Um, Kind of just like that sense of imposter syndrome, which I think, you know, yeah. you were just talking to. Yeah, yeah, so, he, yeah, so he, he he, obviously has a massive amount of imposter syndrome. He, um, you know, in, in every episode, I think there's a moment where he says, I can't do this about literally every situation. He doesn't think he's the right guy. And again, we all know people like that. Some of, some of us are people like that who, 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 who feel like, feel like that every day. So it's, um, yeah, I, I just tried to be uh, played as real as possible. And because you start the series, like being up in the flight deck with the rest of the crew and then being on the ground, that's such a different trajectory for the character. And so for you, what were the changes that you wanted to start seeing in him once he's in a different place, in a different position? Well, that's a great question. Um, what did I want to start seeing for him? I mean, see, to be honest, it felt like a bit of a holiday because all those lads were still going up into that plane and shooting those scenes were hard. And I was going to Oxford and sort of drinking tea with Belle Pauly, which felt like a vacation, while they were all going to POW camp, sort of going back up into the, you know, the the, the planes. Because we, we would have to be loaded onto these planes 
Um, and we were up there for about eight or nine hours and we, it felt like you were you had a roller coaster being banged about. So, you know, having to to film scenes walking about a quad in Oxford, you know, felt like felt like a day off, you know. Um, but what did I want to show when he wasn't in the planes? With Crosby, I wanted to show a real arc of of him becoming a hero. I wanted to show, I kept thinking of a quote that like, if you're not afraid, it's not bravery. Bravery is being afraid and doing it in spite of that, you know. And I wanted to to sort of, I don't know, he's like he's like he's the little guy, you know what I mean? And he, he sort of he wins and he has his he, he, like you want to root for him. You know, when I was reading his book, when I was reading the script, I, I wanted to I wanted the audience to 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 care for him. And for the first few episodes, you see him at the lowest of the low, and then he starts getting these small wins. And I want I wanted people to be like, go on, Crosby, you know, because I felt like that when I was reading it. I, when I was I was going, yes, you know, I I I want him to succeed. Um, so I I hope that people feel that when they watch it too. Absolutely, and and you know, you were talking there about the idea of of bravery, and there's such a coexistence of bravery and fear, especially for for Crosby. And I know that part of the research that you did was speaking to a lot of people, including a soldier who had served in Iraq, who literally described the sense of fear being like a physical taste of metal in your mouth. And I was just interested in through the conversations that you had with various people, how you found the way in which fear impacted Crosby as a character for the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's such a massive thing. And it's, and it's, it, it's fear in, in, in so many different senses. There's the fear of like the physical fear of having to get into the plane, go up in the air. There's like the emotional fear of like losing friends. And there's also that aspect as we, as we go on, the fear of oneself, you know, like that, but about becoming a monster about, you know, these guys were heroes. They 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 saved the world as we know it today, but they they were also they killed so many innocent people. You know there was so much of that that you know that there's a scene with Nate and I, Rosie and I, at the end of the the series by by the fire, and we're talking about you know all this killing we do. I, I think it changes someone. I think it changes who you are, um, and I think there's the fear of that also. You know that inter in, introspective fear and yeah. Are you from England or America? Where are you from? Uh, I'm I'm originally from England, but I've been in America for 15 okay. years. So I've got a <laughs> dual accent. <laughs> accent. I'm just, I was listening to it going, where is that from? I, was, I needed to ask. Okay, cool. It's from both. <laughs> okay, grand. Okay, grand. Okay. I mean, I mean that that conversation later in the series as well. You know, there's there's so many touch points and moments about the idea of losing your sense of who you were because they're no longer the same people that they were at the beginning because of the experiences they've had, the things that they've seen, the loss that they've experienced on such a, a massive scale. Um, and so for you, what was Crosby's relationship of, you know, who I was when I left home, the life I have there and the person that I'm becoming so far away from it all? Well, his story doesn't tie up in a bow more than any of the other lads. There's, there's, there's a bit of like moral ambiguity there, you know, when, he, when he's, when he's, uh, this is like spoilers, but uh, you know when he's when he's when he leaves and you know about what 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 he's been through with, in his personal life with his wife, what he's been through, you know that he has a son, you know there's there's so there's so much, you know, I think from the first scene or the first episode or whatever when we see Crosby to the last, I I do feel like he feels like a different man. I do feel like he feels like he's been on. A, a real journey and I I I like and and um when we were sort of going through different drafts spoke with the writers about n not having this kind of like cookie cutter ending you know and, it's, and it was all fine you know because it's it, I think it's kind of nice that you you you're happy for him but there's a tinge of sadness there's you know you know those last frames that last episode I think I think the the director and the writer really nailed it with, with Crosby's journey Absolutely. And, you know, I think throughout as well, the, the show kind of constantly looks at those moments of escapism and how to get outside of your head when mm -hmm. you're dealing with something like that day to day. Um, and so when you were looking at Crosby and kind of thinking, OK, how how would he behave? What would be his release? How would he try to get out of his his head from the day? How did you kind of answer the question of what that looked like? Well, there's that line uh, Crosby says, you know, 
some men slept around, some men drank. If you got a chance to forget, you took it. And, you know, there was the highest percentage of divorce happened after World War II in America. There was such a big boom of, of divorces. And I think it's because so many of these lads went over and experienced such hardship. I mean, you, they were in these tin cans up in the sky and they would see their friends' heads get blown off. And then suddenly they had to come back and just resume work, go be a butcher, go be a doctor, go be a school teacher, struggling with what we would now call PTSD back then. It wasn't shell shock in World War II. It was um, war fatigue. You know, there's just these ra just random words were thrown on it. You know, he's, he's got fatigue and he'd be there, you know, in, in some sort of deep psychosis speaking to a dead friend, you know. So the, these lads were were um, were um so messed up after. And it was, you know, like that line, if you got a chance to forget, you took it. It's not like if you confronted what had happened to you and dealt with it through therapy or dealt with it through whatever. It's like if you got a chance to forget, you took it. You didn't speak about it. You, you, you put it right down there. You drank, you slept around, you forgot as, as as much as you could try to, you forgot. So I think um it was terrible for these lads coming back. I mean, in a modern context, when people serve now, they come back and they have therapy and there's things like that built around them. But but back then, this is, you know, it's just the 40s, so none of that existed. And I mean, I, I think in that same vein of of things that weren't said out loud in a different direction is the idea of these incredibly close relationships that start to exist between everyone. And the fact that you have to literally trust the person sitting next to you with your life, um, you know, and we see throughout the series, through all your characters, just the love that really does exist between them, but it's not something that's expressed with the language of today. Um, and so how did you set about wanting to capture that sense of just intrinsic trust and, and love that exists when it's not a, a dialogue driven conversation, but it's very much the subtext under the surface? Yeah, well, it's this thing as well, you know, like, like neither of my granddads hug me, you know, they're both dead now, God rest their souls, but neither of them like hugged me, do you know what I mean? And that's not because they didn't love me. They did. I, both of them did. But it's just that's not what men done back then, you know. So it's like when we're when we're filming this these scenes and you know you go oh my, it's like that's not you know it's it's not twenty twenty four like that you there's there's a certain rigidity to the physicality. There's a certain you know a little bit of a stoicism, but just it's you got to get yourself into like, you got to think about the epoch, like what time, what was happening in that time, what was happening in that culture. Um, how did people express their love for one another, you know? Um, and it's, you just do it in different ways. I mean, how I done it with Rosie was, um, these lads were like best mates in real life. And I said to Nate early on, like, how, like the only reason I'm friends with people is because they make me laugh. I'm not friends with people because they're honorable. I'm not friends with people because, you know, I, I appreciate their morals. I'm friends with people because when I spend time with them, I laugh. You know what I mean? And I feel like so many friendships are like that. Female friendships, male friendships. And I said to Nate, let's, you know, let's just implement that. That's every time we see each other. Like, why else would we be hanging out so often? Let's try and, like, if it's a big scene where there's kind of a weird in it, let's try and have a bit of crack at the start. Let's try and, you know, have some fun. Um, because that that's 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 how, that's how we interact, how Nate and I interacted, you know? So it was trying to show love through through subtle, subtle things like that, that, that felt right for the time period and right for men at that time. I love that. And and with the, the body language and the stoicism to that that you were bringing up, there's obviously certain body language elements and mannerisms that are specific to serving and, and being in the army. So you kind of take that sense of, you know, I'm kind of like finding myself in this new physical way um, based on what's required of me. And then you have the moments where you know, nobody's looking and, you know, what does that look like? So what were the different elements of just the physicality and the ma the body mannerisms that you found? I guess I just, I mean, I would go back to that clip a lot. And when I'm trying to find the physicality of a character, I, I like do things about the house is him. You know, like I said earlier, you make a cup of tea, you, 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 I, I do things like, oh, how would he dance? You know, how, how would Crosby sort of sort of move or whatever, you know? And you try and do like just little small things like that. 
you know, how, how is he when he's on his own? How is he when no one's around? And he just breathes out. He's had a hard day, you know, and you just think of all these different little things before you get to set. And then, but then when you're on set, like you don't, you don't need to think of these things. They're just coming naturally. Um, so again, it's not really like, a, a, I don't know if I'm like, if it's a cerebral thing or I'm th if I'm thinking how do I phys physically do this? It's more of a, you, you sort of just know him and have him in your body as much as possible. And then, whenever they're shot in action you just let whatever the other person's doing inform you and then just just let just let the physicality happen you know yeah and in terms of the performance overall as well you know especially with your character there's so many logistical elements that he's trying to get out and he's trying to communicate that are necessary within scenes um but you still have to make sure it always feels character driven. So even when he's giving directives, you know, navigation details, it's like, it still always has to feel like it's coming from the character and where is his headspace at that moment? So how did you set about balancing those two things in your performance? Well, I mean, it's, he's a soldier and he's, he's a war hero and he's incredibly proficient, even though he doesn't think he is, but he, you know, he's, he, you know, he, 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 he can do the job. He's, he's incredible. He knows exactly what he's doing. That, you know, there's, there's the, there's the two sort of sides of him. There's the war hero who was the best navigator possibly there had ever been. And then there's the, there's the ego, the, the sense of self of, you know, this kind of, I'm not the right man for the job. Oh God, can I do that? You know, and it's trying to, it's just trying to balance those things and, 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 and both are true. But it's just trying to, you know, amalgamate both and 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 make them both feel, um, both make them both feel real, yeah. And you were talking earlier on about the technology in the show, and it's it's kind of really astounding how it was filmed. Where in essence, you were in these replica planes that they would be raising up, and you were talking about, you know, there's screens on either side, so you can literally see. Okay, if there's going to be a plane to the right and it's getting closer, then that's something that you're visually seeing while filming it, which obviously is such a gift because usually you don't get those moments. Um, you know, often it's done in green screen and effects afterwards. And so, how did that really help in just like calibrating a lot of the the more intricate beats within scenes for you oh it was a gift to be honest because you, you you weren't having to like you know see a green screen and go ah like you were you were actually seeing the planes come towards you you would feel the rumble of the plane you were getting knocked around left right and center you were you were literally just trying to survive up there you know you were just trying to go just don't bang your head and bang your knees and it, it felt that there was you know there was you were shooting the gun that was firing blanks and then the shells were falling all over your desk and you're having to wipe the, the shells out to try and do the navigation. So, you know, the team really made it as real as possible for us up there. So we didn't have to think much. We were just trying to hold on for dear life, to be honest. I love that, you know, and, and you had so many amazing consultants on the show, including Dale Dye, who was a military advisor who's done films like Saving Brian Ryan, Band of Brothers, The Pacific. Um, what were some of the details for you specifically that he really helped you to find? Psychologically, Dale Dye was, was brilliant. He made us march and I was going to myself, why are we marching? We don't march in the show. We could be doing so. I want to shoot the guns again. I really, I like shooting the guns. That was great. Why are we marching? And it was only until the third day of marching that we stopped sort of shuffling, you know, stopped going like all, you know, all over the place. And suddenly there was 50 actors just going. And we started to move as one in unison. And it really gave me a sense of like what it would have to be like in that plane. He spoke about a thing called crew glue, of being you and your crew moving as one, thinking as one, because you're operating this this plane as one that you, you're not worried about with the man on the left or right of you thinking you're genuinely just you're in this sort of you know shared consciousness almost thing and it was through marching that I found that but it wasn't something someone could tell you you just had to sort of come to it on your own so there was loads of wee small things like that that Dale Dye was was really great for plus he's very he's very funny you know he's a very funny guy he was good to have around I love that. And and when it comes to kind of your work overall, I've heard you talking in the past about how your work on stage in particular really taught you a lot about just giving your full self and giving all of yourself to your craft. Um, and particularly for a show like this that required so much of you, I was just interested in kind of how that sense of just fully giving yourself over to your craft really translated into the work you did on this show. 
Yeah, well, I mean, look, it's a privilege to be an actor. It's such a privileged job and like the privilege is never lost on me. And it's, yeah, it's, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's good fun. It's great crack. I, 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 I love doing it. I love when you, you, you just give yourself to the world and go, okay, now I, um, you know, I'm John Wilkes Booth and it's 18, 65 America and I, I'm trying to kill Lincoln or you're going okay I've got to save the world against these Nazis and, but I've got air sickness and you fully give yourself to whatever that is and for, for, I, for, so I just love it I just think it's just a, just just great but yeah you're talking about theatre and, and how theatre reformed me with that I think theatre you there's there's a lot of world building going on because you do like a, a, a an intense rehearsal process where everyone sits around and, and talks about each little line, each punctuation mark and, and how that felt and the backstory and you really build it. And on film, very often, you just get there on the day and you shoot it. There's not much time to discuss with other people about that. So when you're like this, when you're given the privilege of, of a three-week book camp before you start, it's um, it's great. And it really made me feel like I was back doing a play again because you could everyone was banding in together and um and having fun. Banding in, band brothers. That was hey. on the time. <laughs> oh, you got to take it. You got to send an invoice for that plug later. <laughs> well, I really, really love what you what you've created in this series, and I'm so excited for people to get to see the beautiful character arc that you've crafted throughout the the rest of the season. So, congratulations on an amazing series, and thank you so much. Thank you very much. That's very kind. Cheers.